Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and welcome to another great day at Google. Um, I am uh, distinctly honored uh, today to welcome to Google uh, Secret Secretary of State uh, Condoleezza Rice, as well as uh, British Foreign Secretary uh, David Miliband. Um, as you know, they, they uh, wrestle with some of the world's uh, most important issues on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so it's a huge, uh, huge uh, honor for us to have them to come out uh, to see us uh, today. Um, you know, um, Secretary of State uh, Rice obviously needs very little introduction to, to all of us. Uh, all of the Stanford folks here uh, remember her illustrious career uh, on the farm. Uh, and of course, she served uh, since, as Secretary of State since 2005 and before that, National Security Advisor. Um, uh, British Foreign Secretary uh, Miliband um, uh, became Foreign Secretary uh, last year, June of 2007. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, had, uh, I knew that was right. Uh, and uh, uh, before that, had, had served in uh, a variety of other positions, including Environment, uh, environment Minister uh, in the UK, and is a, very much a leader on uh, climate issues uh, uh, in the world. Uh, we're also happy to, uh, to, to report that uh, he's one of, he was the first uh, 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 MP, I believe, and minister in, uh, uh, in the UK to start using blogs and wikis, uh, and he has his own YouTube channel. So uh, a kindred <laughs> spirit indeed. Only one thing I've done first. <laughs> so we're, we're really gratified that you're both willing to, to come here and share your thoughts today. Now, um, perhaps a good way to get started, uh, Secretary Rice, is maybe to just talk a little bit about uh, kind of why you're here um, and uh, the purpose behind the visit. Um, we know you're showcasing innovation, and uh, we like to think we do a little bit of that here. But perhaps you could talk a little bit about, about that and, uh, for us. I'd be very glad to do that. First of all, David, thank you very much for all the hospitality. Thanks to all the members of the Google family for uh, inviting us here. I want to say hi to Sergey. He did well despite the fact that he was uh, around as a student when I was at Stanford. Uh, I apparently didn't do any harm to you, Sergey, even though you were a student. Um, and I, I wanted to come to the Silicon Valley, to what has become my home, and to bring one of my best friends among the foreign ministers to uh, look at innovation and technology and new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things. because. Uh, as we struggle with uh, any number of problems, but particularly those that relate to innovation, to uh, the need for new sources of energy, for uh, clean technologies that will allow us to be both uh, countries that can grow our economies and countries that can provide environmental stewardship, uh, we need new ideas and uh, we need new ways of thinking about it. And I don't think there's any place in the world that is better at bringing about people who want to think differently than the Silicon Valley. And uh, this trip really started uh, with our first dinner when David first came as foreign secretary and we started talking about some of the challenges of climate change, of uh, energy security, um, of innovation. Um, I talked a lot to David about the important relationship that we've developed in the United States between basic research in universities and then commercialization of that research. And uh, I promised at that time that I was going to bring him to the most dynamic, innovative, interesting, and fun place to be on the entire planet. And we're here in Silicon Valley. Great. So, so our, our format today is uh, we, we, I've got a few things and topics to chat about. And then we're going to uh, we have a, a moment to uh, open it up to, to Googlers uh, after that. So uh, maybe, maybe a place to start is um, on, on the innovation question and sort of global competitiveness. And um, Foreign Secretary Miliband, maybe you can jump in on this to, to start. But um, it, it, I think few would disagree that it's, it's pretty much a given that going forward, uh, the West, particularly the United States, UK, uh, are not going to sort of dominate the world economy, that it's become much more uh, competitive. Uh, you see China, uh, India, Brazil, uh, many of the countries uh, making enormous progress. Uh, in light of those developments, how, how, do you, how do you think the U.S., or uh, the U.K. in particular, and perhaps Secretary Rice could talk about the U.S., how, how do we stay competitive? Well, maybe I should talk about the U.S. and you talk yes, about the U.K. Yeah, that would be <laughs> quite uh, interesting. I, I think the first thing to say is that what unites us uh, very profoundly as we think about the challenges of the modern world is that you can't solve the big problems with government alone. And if you want to solve the big problems, 
you have to engage with the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world, be the problem climate change, or be the problem international terrorism, or be the issue of nuclear proliferation. These are issues that require governments, but they also need businesses and markets aligned behind a common set of goals, and they need mass mobilization. Hmm. And I think it's interesting, as we've had the presentations over the last two hours, you've talked a lot, or we've talked a lot, about how we bring, or how you bring, information to individuals. And we've seen your maps, and we've seen a whole range of health projects that you're developing. But actually, one of the most interesting things that you do is that you bring together communities. You create communities. And if you buy the argument that to achieve change, you need government, you need markets, and you need the mass mobilization of individuals, then I think one of the things that we have to think about is how do communities come together, because they're not going to come together in the old ways in drafty trade union halls. They're going to have to come together in new ways, and that's why I think uh, the, the significance of being here, uh, not just in Silicon Valley, but uh, here at uh, Google. I think in respect of the changes in the nature of the sort of global economy, I think there are a couple of things I'd say. First of all, let's not get this out of perspective. Chinese income per head is between 1 20th and 1 25th of the American levels. In 10 years' time, China will be richer. It'll be closer to the US, but the, the US will still be a superpower economically as well as politically and militarily and culturally. So the first thing is let's keep this in some kind of uh, perspective. This remains a massive jobs and wealth machine. Why does it remain a, a massive jobs and wealth machine? Because it brings together people, money, and ideas in a unique way. And I think that's the key, not just for the US, but for a country like mine. I mean, the UK is 60 million people, so it's a couple of Californians, uh, maybe, and uh, <laughs> if only. Uh, the, uh, um, we're, we're 60 million people. And if you look at the successful parts of our economy, and I think this is something that's important in politics, often we look at what are the problems and how do we solve them. Sometimes it's better to look at what's working and why does it work? If you look at the most successful parts of the UK economy, which are in London and the Southeast, which I think rival uh, California for income per head, the reason is that people, money, and ideas are coming together in a unique way. And I think that is the absolute uh, key for nations. Just one final point. Uh, it's got to be part of an open trading system. We, as the United Kingdom, have been big winners from globalization. And globalization brings big problems, climate problems, uh, inequality problems, uh, insecurities, but the answer to globalization is not less globalization, but more. More trade is actually important, and I think this, we might return to that in the course of the discussion. Yeah. Let me pick up where David left off, because um, it's an interesting question. Where will the United States, or the UK, or Europe for that matter, be relative to the, the emerging powers, uh, India, Brazil, and certainly China, the dominant emerging power? I think that the, um, the way that the United States thought about this after World War II gives us a clue, because at a time when the U.S. probably controlled almost 50% of the world's GDP because of the war and the devastation of other countries, we didn't think, well, let's protect that 50%. We thought of the international economy as having infinite possibilities for expansion. And if it continued to expand, there was plenty of room for everybody to expand, and no one had to be a loser if others expanded. And I think that's the essential key now to going forward. It means that if we are afraid of competition, if we start to try to close ourselves off somehow from competition, if we try to protect that part of the economy which we have, then I think we're going to end up losers from the next round of globalization rather than winners uh, in the way that we were after World War II. Um, secondly, um, I'm a strong believer um, in the light hand of government and uh, the strong power of uh, innovation through the private sector and particularly a private sector that can be open to people and ideas from all over the world. As I look out uh, at the folks here at Google, I see that uh, the United States is succeeding because we are not putting up barriers to people who want to come here and be a part of this great growth of international capital, but made here in the United States. Because I doubt that Google really thinks of itself as an American company. You are really a global company. But you found your home here uh, in this little part of California because the environment is right, because creativity is encouraged. 
uh, because both success, uh, success is rewarded and if you fail, you get up the next day and you keep going. There are a certain set of values that are very much endemic to this part of the world, so you found a way to create the culture of innovation here but you're contributing to the global economy. And I think as long as the United States remains open to people from around the world who want to come here and be part of the international economy from here, we'll be fine. And the final point I'd make is, um, as an American, um, I am not at all uh, fearful of uh, com competition. But the United States has to recognize that perhaps our most serious national, uh, national security challenge maybe in providing an educational system that makes it possible for Americans uh, born right down the road here in Mountain View or born across uh, the bay in East Oakland to uh, acquire the skills and the education uh, that's going to make it possible for them to compete. Because I can, I can assure you, if we don't provide that, if it ever becomes the case that it's no longer true in America, that it didn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going, if we ever lose that, which is essentially at the core of who we are, then we are going to be fearful, and we are going to be protectionist, and we are going to try to hang on to that little piece of the economy that we have. So I think those are some lessons that we've learned, but because I'm very confident in the ability of America to compete, of Americans to compete, and of our ability to stay open to the best talents uh, from all of the world. Um, I think that when some Secretary of State sits here in uh, 20 or 30 years, we'll still be talking about American leadership of the international economy. Great. So, um, okay, so let's talk about Iraq. Um, so <laughs> kind of abrupt, but all right. <laughs> I think, figured we'd get there eventually. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just get there right away. So, um, you're uh, looking very uncomfortable. I don't know why. What no, I'm very comfortable I, I, about it. <laughs> Me? I was, what? I was just there a little while ago. Okay. So, so you have a, a first-hand perspective, of yeah. course. Um, so, okay. So, roll forward five years. It's 2013. How far has Iraq come? Uh, how many British and American troops are going to be there? What does it look like? I'd like to hear you, each of your answer to that. Yeah. Well, let me start, and then maybe David will uh, will fill in. I. We all have, uh, there are many differences of view about uh, why we decided the liberation of Iraq was in our interest. There are many differences, differences of views about uh, whether or not we uh, did our work well. Mm -hmm. um, I have said on any number of occasions there will be dissertations and many, many, many books written about uh, the mistakes of the Bush administration. I will probably oversee some of those uh, dissertations myself. But um, the time to judge all of that will come later. What we're looking at right now is the birth of the first multi-ethnic democracy in the Middle East. And it's hard. It's really hard. Because this is a place uh, that has known nothing but tyranny, uh, has known a lot of violence in its history, but that is slowly trying to emerge as a place that can provide a decent life and a decent political system for its people to resolve their differences by politics, not by violence, and not by repression. And lest we think that there's something wrong with the Iraqis, that they haven't gotten it right in five years, I would ask people to remember that the United States was born with a certain birth defect. My ancestors, were relegated to three-fifths of the man, a man. And the Iraqis have not made a compromise nearly that bad. Secondly, I come from Birmingham, Alabama. And still, in 1964, which I know for all of you is ancient history, but for me, I was 10, <laughs> you still couldn't guarantee the right to vote for blacks living in Alabama. So democracy is hard. And we cannot afford to be impatient with people in the Middle East as they try to find a way to reconcile individual rights with old traditions, Islam and democracy, the role of religion and the role of the state. Many of these we resolved many, many centuries ago. They haven't. 
and it's going to be hard. So I can't tell you exactly what it will look like in five years. I can't tell you what the American and British posture will look like. I suspect it will be far, far less than it is now mm -hmm. if, uh, if we do our, continue to do our work well. But I can tell you that the last time I was in Iraq, or maybe the time before that, I sat in a provincial council in the city of Kirkuk. It is a place where Arabs and Turkmen and Kurds come together, and it has been a place that has been racked by violence or by repression for its entire history. And I sat with the provincial council as they talked about how to share power peacefully. The Middle East needs more of that, because in too much of the world, difference is still a license to kill. And unless countries learn to resolve their differences through political processes and through democratic processes, you only have one of two other choices. They do it violently or they do it by repression. And neither should be morally acceptable to the United States of America as we sit here in freedom. Um, let, let me just say three, uh, three quick things uh, about this. First, I think it's significant that you're asking about the next five years and how we shape it, not let's diagnose the last five years. Because I think in, in, in my country, uh, as in yours, the Iraq war was a very, very divisive political issue. But I think whatever the depth of the divisions about the origins of the war and the decision to go to war, I don't think it's impossible to forge unity about the next five years. Secondly, why do I say that? There are three things that actually everyone can agree on. One, there needs to be a massive improvement in the security situation. Secondly, it's got to be founded on political reconciliation of the different groups that Condi has talked about. And third, they've got to be able to build a de decent economic and social life for themselves. And in all three of those dimensions, I think we've got a role to play. Uh, our focus is in the south of Iraq, around the city of Basra, a city of about two million people near the Kuwait border. We've got about 4,100 troops there. They're focused on training up a division of the Iraqi army with about 10,000 troops in that division. And that is a city uh, that is, uh, has undergone big change, even in the last three or four months, because there's been major change there. Third thing uh, I want to just say is that there are different Iraqs if you go to the north and talk to Kurds, which I have. There's a different Iraq if you're in Baghdad, where you've got deep divisions between Sunni and Shia, and actually within the Shia. And there's a different Iraq in Basra, which is a 95% Shia city. And there are different challenges of security, politics, and economics in those three different parts uh, of the country. And I think it's important, and some of the reporting that I've seen in the US over the last three days since I've been here, begins to reflect the complexities that exist. And I think that's a good thing. Could I just add, David, on the reconciliation? Because it is absolutely true that they need to achieve uh, political reconciliation. Um, and there were a number of laws that we hoped that they would pass. And I think it is it's somehow begun to, uh, it, it hasn't gotten the publicity um, that it was getting when they weren't passing the laws, that in fact, they've now passed a debathification law. They have passed uh, two budgets, which by the way, the United States seems to be having trouble doing in our Congress. Uh, they have passed an amnesty law. They have passed an elections law. Uh, they have passed a provincial powers law. And the one law that remains to be passed is a hydrocarbons law that will look at uh, not revenue sharing. They've agreed on how the revenue be, will be shared among various parts of the country, but on how contracting will be handled and the like. And so this is a political system that is moving forward and starting to make progress. It is still very fragile. As you know, uh, David, in Basra, where uh, Britain has done a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, Iraqi forces are now in control of Basra rather than the militias that were there just uh, a couple of months ago. And so this is a, a difficult situation, but it's a new democracy that's being born, and uh, it's something that uh, if, if it succeeds, and I believe that they will, it will change the face of the Middle East. Foreign Secretary Miliband, um, continuing on, on Iraq and the war, you, you talked uh, last year at the Labor Party con conference about uh, repairing relationships with millions of uh, Muslims around the world uh, who feel alienated uh, with the West about the war, about uh, Western uh, sort of participation in Middle East affairs in general. What, what, what do you feel, if you, how, how do you feel, what are the concrete steps you think that you've been taken to repair those? Um, 
this came home to me just as, by, by way of preview when I went to the uh, meeting of the Pakistan Youth Parliament, 120 people between the ages of 20 and 40, really. And uh, it struck me that it's one thing for people to disagree with our actions, which many of them did, but they also distrusted our motivations. And I think it's important that we address the motivational question, because the truth is that the terrorism that you suffered on 9-11 and that we suffered on 7-7, the 7th of July 2005, is different from the sort of terrorism that certainly we faced before from the IRA or elsewhere. It's based on a global um, jihadist ideology, which has got a very clear narrative at its heart. And that narrative is that the West wants to humiliate Muslim populations in Muslim countries. And we've got to take that on directly. And so to answer your question, I think there are three or four things that are important to that. One, there are millions of Muslims in our own countries. They are the best advocates for our values, actually. And Muslims from Britain, whose origins are often in Pakistan or Bangladesh, but also in my own constituency, actually from the Yemen, um, are very good advocates for that. And I think that that's important that we talk about how our own values are lived out in the equality of opportunity that we're trying to breed uh, in our own uh, countries. Secondly, we've got to live up to our values in the way that we exercise our policies around the world. And that's something that we do when we try to stand up for democratic values and democratic uh, accountability, which is uh, important. Third, and uh, importantly, I think we've always got to be clear, and maybe we haven't done this as well as we should, because I often get questions about this in Britain in respect, in respect of Afghanistan. We are in these countries, like Afghanistan and Iraq, not to create new colonies. My country has a history of having colonies, <laughs> right? We've learned our lesson on that. We're not getting back into that, but we do know that weak states around the world do need the support of stronger states like ours. And we should be there standing up for a set of values. And I think that that's an important uh, thing to get across because this uh, long-term struggle to show that there, we are not doomed to a quote-unquote clash of civilizations hmm. does mean engaging with people's hearts and minds and engaging with the motivational question as well as the question of whether people agree with what we do or disagree. Well, Secretary Rice, what about the, bro the broader question of sort of the U.S. image in the, in the world? Uh, some would say that uh, because of the war and, and other factions, we're, not just, we're just not as popular as we used to be. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you think, do you believe that's true? And if so, what are the things that we, we need to do to, to work on that? Well, I'm always torn because, okay. um, of course, I would, <clears throat> would like uh, to read opinion polls and hear that... Uh, the, uh, that American policy and uh, the Bush administration is beloved in every corner of the earth. That would be terrific. Um, but it's actually not the important question. Yeah. Uh, the important question is, um, are we using our time and uh, doing the things that we believe uh, are worthy of American power and influence to leave a stronger, better, more democratic, and peaceful world? And I think we are. And some of them have not been popular. Um, it has been difficult in Iraq. But I still believe that Saddam Hussein was a menace that would have made it impossible to have the different kind of Middle East that we need. Um, I know that it was, uh, not, has not been popular uh, to talk in the terms about war when we talk about terrorists. But, um, I was in the bunker in the White House on September 11th. The terrorists didn't just try to terrorize, terrorize us, they tried to take us down. Mm -hmm. They went after our financial center, they went after the Pentagon, they intended to go after the Capitol. And my first act that day was first to place a call to the Russians and I talked to President Putin about the potential spiral of alerts as our military forces went up and Russian military forces might also start to alert, he already added, he said, we're standing down, which said to me, we're not in the Cold War anymore. Mm -hmm. But the next call that I made was to ask uh, the State Department to make sure that they got a cable out to every post in the world to say the United States of America has not been decapitated. Because I could imagine those pictures on television around the world. That was an act of war. And if we don't recognize that, then I think we don't mobilize all of the elements that we need. But it's not a war that we can win militarily. Right. And uh, you have to 
chase down terrorists and you have to take away their, their strongholds and so forth. But ultimately, and it gets back to your question, we do have to win hearts and minds. That's ultimately the way that we do it. We have to convince people uh, that there is a better way than dressing your children up as suicide bombers and sending them to kill other children. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to convince people that uh, there is a better way that is hopeful and that is peaceful and that is democratic. And that's the debate that we uh, have to win. And frankly, uh, our policies haven't always been popular, but if I ask what's unpopular about the quadrupling of foreign assistance for Africa that this administration has done, the doubling of foreign assistance for Latin America, the tripling of foreign assistance worldwide, the now more than uh, the president asked for $30 billion to fight the pandemic of AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at uh, some of the things that we've tried to do, including trying to uh, advocate for democracy in places that have not had it, and the work that David and I both engage in, trying to finally uh, help the Israelis and the Palestinians in their conflict and to give the Palestinians a decent life in their own state, these people have had enough. They need their own state. Um, I think we're pursuing some policies that perhaps people would think of in that way. But the most important point that I would make is whatever people think of the American government, they generally love Americans. And um, we are not, uh, as the government, going to ever, quote, improve the image of America. What improves the image of America is when Americans travel abroad as students or when people come here to study as students and uh, they get to know that in fact we are uh, a country that deeply values and diversity that is uh, a tolerant country um, and where people of all religions, faiths, ethnic backgrounds, nationalities uh, live together in a quite remarkable way because given how different we are, it's amazing uh, how much this country uh, has found to build on in common. Okay. Well, um, let, let me stay with the, 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 the topic of terrorism for a moment. Um, and I'd like to get from each of you um, your self-assessment. Self-assessments are something we like to do here at Google. <laughs> we, do our, we, we grade ourselves about how, how well we're doing. But uh, almost, uh, almost seven years since 9-11, we're approaching the third anniversary of the 7-7 seven, seven bombings in London. Can you give us your self-assessment, each of you, of how you've done, uh, how your governments have done? And, in combat or stemming the tide of, uh, of, of global terrorism. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, After you, David. Very generous. That's what we call a hospital pump. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think the first thing to say, uh, and this uh, maybe explains my caution on this, on the 7th of July 2007, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police went onto the radio and gave an interview at 10 past 8, talking about how safe Britain was and how well we'd done to ensure that since the 9th of the 11th of September 2001, right. there'd been no similar attack. Right. And one hour later, yeah. one hour and 20 minutes later, there was an attack. So uh, I think there's more than the usual degree of political caution in this area. I mean, I don't think any government should ever give itself A+. Plus. I mean, that's just, uh, I don't know about your self-assessments, but uh, it seems to me uh, any government would. Plus, sorry? <laughs> Mine are always A. Plus. Yours are always A. Plus, yeah. But I don't know. Is that the 360 degree feedback as well that gives you an A? Plus <laughs> that's, another, another that's another story. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think we've always got to have a real sense of humility. And uh, the way, what I'd say we've tried to do and what I, we've learned over the last few years, I think, is one, we, we have a much better understanding of what we're up against. I don't think when people were talking about this, I mean, we arrested someone in Birmingham in 2000 who was trying to blow up Birmingham, UK. I don't think we really understood what we were up against. Right. And I think that we do understand it better in some of the work that's been done in both of our countries about the nature of this global insurgency, I think is very, very important. We've also learned, and I think this is really important, millions of people might disagree with our foreign policy. That doesn't mean they become terrorists. And I think we understand more about the process of radicalization that turns people from disagreement to, to violence than we did, and I think that, that's, um, I think that is important. Secondly, I think that there is, um, we have better defenses. I don't think there's any question uh, about that, and there's, uh, there's a range of overt and covert ways in which our uh, defenses are uh, stronger, which I, think is, which I think is good. In our own country, 
we have got a better dialogue with our own Muslim communities. And I think that, that is, and I think that's important. And the final thing I'd say, and I do think this is important, um, that Condi just talked on at the end, this question of uh, peace in the Middle East. I mean, if there's one thing that actually animates the jihadist narr narrative, it is the claim that they are sp standing up for the Palestinians. Now, actually, the people who are standing up for the Palestinians are the Palestinian leaders elected by the Palestinians who are trying to negotiate their own state. And I, I think that in a range of areas, but above all that one, we are taking away some of the props of a malign and uh, untrue narrative. And I think that's a very important thing to do. Well, in many ways, for me, every day um, has been September 12th. Um, you couldn't be in a position of authority on September 11th and uh, not, and simply have it go away, even though it's been um, now seven years. Um, and because I know that they only have to be right once and we have to be right 100% of the time, you're never going to hear me say that we've done well in shutting off this threat. Um, this is going to be a generational struggle. I think we've done good work in breaking up networks. Uh, the network as it attacked us in September 11th is probably all but done, but they have regenerated in other ways and uh, more decentralized ways. I think we have better intelligence and law enforcement sharing than, than we certainly had uh, prior to uh, September 11th. We've certainly made some improvements in our defenses. Uh, but it's a long struggle because uh, whatever it is that uh, makes people decide that they're going to kill other innocent people or kill innocent people, um, is, it, it has to come out of a well so deep that it's going to, a well of, of malignancy so deep that it's going to take a while uh, to get to the bottom of it. And so um, I think we've got a, a long struggle. Um, I think we've done some things well. I'm sure there's some that we've not done so well. But um, I have a, a saying that I now use quite a lot, and I have a way that I keep it in my mind uh, at the department. Um, I very often tell people, few people who travel with me in the press will have heard it before, that um, today's headlines uh, are rarely the same as history's judgment. And um, if you don't think that that's true, um, it helps to look at the portraits of two secretaries of state that I keep very close to me. Uh, everybody has Thomas Jefferson, all right, first secretary of state. Um, everybody has George Marshall, probably the greatest secretary of state. But I also have Dean Acheson, who at the time that he um, was in office was probably known best for who lost China. And is now probably known best for having created the infrastructure of NATO and the post Cold War, uh, the the, the uh, post World War II structures that led to ultimately the peaceful uh, resolution of the Cold War on terms wholly and completely and thoroughly favorable to the West. The other is Seward. Hmm. Remember Seward's ice box? Um, I think we're now glad he bought Alaska. Uh, Seward's folly. And so um, history has a long tail. And um, I think those assessments are, are best left to history. Oh, great. Thank you. So, so l let me transition a bit um, to a topic we actually were, were talking about a little earlier today uh, and that I think uh, many Googlers are very, very interested. And this is this, this, this issue of uh, internet censorship. As we discussed, uh, you know, Google services have been subject to shutdowns, blocks, uh, various forms of uh, harassment and so forth uh, in, in many countries around the world. Uh, it's not just a China issue, although it's often spoken about in terms of, of China. So um, as uh, one of the executives here who spends a lot of time on this, 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 is my, 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 uh, this is my effort, to, shameless effort to get some free advice from the two of you. But for, for, for a multinational company like ours, internet companies, you know, the internet has no borders. Uh, w w what advice do you have for us in terms of how to navigate uh, you know, the, the, the space between you know, our, our values uh, and the fact that uh, you know, many governments around the world are looking to regulate the internet much more than before. Well, I um, do think this is a very serious issue. And in fact, at the State Department, I formed a task force on internet freedom um, because I believe very strongly that the internet is uh, 
possibly one of the greatest tools for democratization and individual freedom that we've ever seen. And uh, I know that there are a lot of governments across the world that are trying to block it, trying to regulate it, uh, trying to make sure that people can't really use it to its full uh, advantage and they may have some minimal success but they really won't be able to undermine its power and uh, so I'm a, a major proponent of uh, internet freedom. I know there will always be uh, some constraints for certain kinds of content that may not be appropriate but I think on balance we ought to uh, err on the side of uh, greater internet freedom not less. Mm -hmm. Um, that becomes particularly a problem um, in countries that may have different standards. And I think what we've got to do, and I tend to believe that this is something that, um, that we, the governments are behind um, in understanding and discussing, is we do need to look at what kinds of norms might make sense. Uh, we talked a little bit upstairs about uh, trying to find a common cause with countries that have similar views of individual liberty of free speech and so forth uh, to try to lead a set of international norms uh, that others might aspire to um, in the way that uh, we have done on issues like uh, corruption and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, bribery in um, financial affairs. And uh, it's something that I I would very much like to uh, go back and give a little bit more thought to. I think it's a really very important issue, and we have had this task force, and uh, it is at the, probably going to be at the core of whether or not people in pretty isolated and in many ways um, pretty tyrannical systems are going to have this opening. Um, I noted, for instance, the Cuban government uh, just made a quote-unquote reform in which uh, people are going to be able to have computers. Well, I would say, how about internet-capable computers? That's a very different world than just computers. And so uh, I would err on the side of uh, freer rather than not, but you're right. It's something the international community really hasn't dealt with very effectively. You know, I feel very, very strongly that we should be against censorship, whether internet or elsewhere. So, I mean, it's not just about uh, the internet, I think there are particular issues raised uh, by the internet about uh, who's censoring and where are they censoring from and whose norms are you adhering to, but I think we should have a very clear basis. I think it is, if you believe in that there is such a thing as a, as a global struggle for social justice, I think you've got to believe that the uh, communications revolution holds out huge potential to bring people together, but also huge potential to fuel the drive for social justice. Because people around the world can see that other people have got equal rights. They can see that they've got freedom of expression. They can see that they've got different uh, living standards. And if it's true that there are more bloggers per head of population in Iran than any other country in the world, that makes me optimistic about the future of Iran. Because there will be people there who are actually seeking to assert their rights and they want to be part of a, uh, a global uh, debate. So I think we should look to see where best practice stands. We should make sure that those of us who are on the side of openness celebrate each other's position and encourage others uh, to join. I mean, it's not for us to give advice uh, to you, I don't think, but I think that through the sort of task force that uh, um, Condi's talked about, we can make sure that the public sector understands where the private sector is going and what its experience is. Okay. Um, there are a few other topics I want to I want to cover, but I know Googlers are eager to ask some questions too. So let, let me let me try to cover these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, energy policy, uh, very important uh, uh, issue uh, at Google. We you know we have a huge interest in that, as I think you you heard upstairs, where and outside. Um, we uh, we recently uh, launched a, an initiative we call RE Less Than C Renewable Energy Cheaper Than Coal. Um, and um, so the first question I guess I'd, I'd ask uh, each of you to to address is. Um, you know, and perhaps Secretary Rice, you could start. Um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about the U.S. not joining the Kyoto uh, Treaty, and the treaty's up for uh, in, in a few years. But what 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 kind of international framework do you think uh, could could get created that the the U.S. would be able to participate in? And, and really be a leader in, in terms of climate change? Well, the United States is participating um, in uh, the framework that was uh, launched at Bali. Right. right. And uh, we believe very strongly that an international framework and conceivably even an international uh, long-range goal makes, uh, makes great sense because we need to uh, diminish our uh, dependence on oil 
and uh, carbon-based uh, energy sources. We need to uh, improve our capacity to provide uh, energy through technological innovation um, as well as uh, conservation. And we need to do so while still permitting growth in economies. Now, our problem with Kyoto had been that we didn't think the goals were achievable. And indeed, an awful lot of countries that signed on to Kyoto have not made their targets. But perhaps most importantly, um, China and India were not a part of that. And you can do everything that you want to to, uh, to diminish or to cut back on uh, carbon emission, um, a CO, uh, to cut back on greenhouse gases from the developed world, if you don't do something about the rising demand of China and India, you're not going to solve the problem. And so we started something called the Asia-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. in which we, China, India, um, South Korea, Australia, and others have now joined, uh, began to look at uh, national uh, plans and uh, national ways of dealing with uh, carbon intensity of the uh, economy. That has pulled China in. We now have something called the Major Economies uh, Program, which should link up with the Bali uh, framework. But we are firmly uh, in. We believe that climate change is a problem. We believe that it has to be addressed, including the uh, human dimension of it. But it has got to include the developing countries, not just the developed ones. The major emerging countries are a real problem. And so uh, we believe that by perhaps making uh, technology available, we favor, for instance, the President favors uh, tariff-free trade in uh, technologies that would be clean. Mm -hmm. um, we have a um, biofuels uh, partnership with Brazil, which is uh, ethanol, but sugarcane-based uh, ethanol that the Brazilians uh, uh, produce. And, uh, it may surprise you uh, that the sort of U.S. number for investment in this whole area is something about $50 billion. So uh, we have been very uh, active. We do believe that one size will not fit all. The particular um, mix of energy um, and economic and uh, e energy and economic profile, for instance, of the United States is simply different than other places in the world. We're sitting here in California. I was very interested to learn about the Google Shuttle because um, when I was provost at Stanford, one of the problems that we had was people didn't have another way to get to work except in their cars. This is a huge country with huge transportation networks. An awful lot of our commerce is through trucking. Uh, we are going to have to mobilize a lot of different solutions to our energy problem but it's not going to be the same set of solutions that you could do in the interior of continental uh, Europe. Right. So um, that's our story. I believe very strongly that uh, we've contributed uh, to this, and, uh, and I believe the UN framework will succeed ultimately. Well, Foreign Secretary, your I, I, I think this is the defining challenge for our generation. It defines our economic challenge, our social justice challenge, as well as our environmental challenge, and it's got big foreign policy implications. And I would plead with you, if America really turns its mind to this, not just its government, because this is about business and this is about individuals uh, as well, then you're going to change the game for everybody else. And our experience, we're 2% of global emissions. Uh, we signed the Kyoto Protocol, um, but significantly because of other decisions as well, we're, we're on track to get a 22, 23% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2010. And we've done so, and in that period, I think the economy's grown by 16 or will have grown by 16 or 17 percent. Um, so we believe that there is a way to combine low carbon with uh, economic uh, growth, and actually, uh, job growth in our environmental sector is faster than any other part of the economy uh, at the moment, and we're not the best European uh, performers. You asked, how do we get an international deal? We'll get an international deal when every country bears its fair share of the climate change burden. And Condi's right, there does have to be a contribution from China, there does have to be a contribution from India, and I believe there will be if we ask them to make a contribution commensurate with their stage of economic development and their level of environmental uh, pollution. But that does mean that the rich countries have got to take a lead. And I think on that basis, and there has been, I think there is movement in the international community on this, on that basis, I think it is possible to get a deal, but it's gonna have to be ambitious. I mean, we're revising up the level of reductions that we're going to have to achieve. We're passing a climate change bill through the United Kingdom Parliament at the moment. 
to achieve at least a 60% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 on 1990 levels. That's not going to be enough because the science has moved on since that target was uh, set. And I think that if we give business the clarity about the long-term trajectory of standards and regulation, then business will innovate within that framework. If business has confidence that there'll be a price on carbon emissions, it will innovate to find low carbon solutions. And part of that, the necessity for that, comes through if you just look at the oil price at the moment. I mean, the oil price is where it is because there's a mismatch of supply and demand. There are too many countries and too many people and too many businesses dependent on oil. So the oil price is going up and we're all suffering because of that. So there's an economic gain as well as an environmental gain. David, you have, though, a very favorable energy mix in part because you shut down a lot of your, your um, and you know, the French have a very favorable energy mix. They get some 80% of it is an electrical generating power from nuclear. Mm -hmm. And so um, the energy mix of different countries is in fact uh, not the same. And the um, particular problems that different countries face are not the same. I, I, I want to repeat, you know, you only have to go out on American highways and see trucking to realize how dependent we are on that for commercial activity. Uh, the president set a goal of uh, reducing our reliance on uh, gasoline, on reducing our reliance on oil. And I actually think that the, the price signal that you're looking for has been picked up um, in industry. It's been picked up for a couple of reasons. First of all, because you're right, the price of oil is giving people a pretty clear price signal. Um, it's also the case that for the Silicon Valley, uh, where venture capital is a major uh, factor, um, price signals, uh, once there's a price signal, it's almost too late. And so the uh, technologies are being developed. And what we've done in the United States is to put a great deal of weight on technological uh, development. It's why um, a couple of years ago, we were spending about $5.8 billion a year uh, in technologies related to climate change. It's why our Greenhouse gas intensity is coming down in the United States at the same time that our economy is growing. So I agree with you, it's a very serious uh, issue. Uh, but I do think we're going to be uh, best off uh, with an international, uh, perhaps an international goal, um, but one that can A, be met, and B, that will probably be met in very different ways by different countries. And I think the more prescriptive that we are about how these goals are to be met, the more difficulty we're going to have with the Chinas and the Indies of the world. China has to produce 25 million new jobs a year just to keep up with its uh, population movement. Uh, it's not going to diminish its growth. Uh, we have to give them solutions that allow both uh, growth and uh, energy stewardship. Uh it's really good in foreign policy because when foreign ministers say how much they agree with each other <laughs> uh, and then give commentaries on each other's questions, you can all see quite how much we agree with each other. And uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, so uh, if I could um, provide a short commentary about how much I agree with what uh, my uh, distinguished uh, colleague has uh, said, that um, the outcome is what matters. It's the overall greenhouse gas emissions, and different countries will do it in different ways, and actually different businesses and different individuals will do it in different ways, because in the end, it doesn't matter whether you reduce your surface transport emissions, or your emissions from buildings, or the emissions from aviation, as long as the overall emissions come down. And that's the importance of not having industry sort of saying, um, prescribing from one centralized place of the world economy that this country will do this amount in this area. What counts is the overall envelope of emissions, and that's why the long-term goal is uh, important. In our experience, you need the combination of strong standards, and I think that uh, what Camille was saying about petrol, uh, yeah, car efficiency standards, standards and that, uh, that's very, very important, and you can apply that in housing and elsewhere, so that, for example, in the UK, by 2016, every new house will have to be zero carbon. Now, it doesn't matter how they get to zero carbon, but it's got to be uh, zero uh, carbon. But I do think that the, you're right to raise the Chinese uh, question, because it's an absolutely profound question. The decisions they're taking now about whether to invest in coal-fired power stations or coal-fired power stations with carbon capture and storage or other forms of energy generation are absolutely critical. And my visits to China suggest that they're ready to be serious about 
There's, but they're looking for us to make sure we show a lead. So that's how much I agree with you on this. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I think we should open it up for uh, Googler's questions. Um, but uh, so as, as folks queue up to the microphones, um, one, one question, Foreign Secretary, I have to ask you. I, I know a little bit about your, your interest in sports, so I have, I have to ask you a less, less, uh, a, a less serious question, but one that might show your prowess as a politician. Uh, there was a little bit of little football soccer for you Americans match uh, last <laughs> night in Moscow uh, involving two uh, British, uh, Amer English teams playing for the European Championship, Manchester United, Chelsea, um, exciting game. Uh, were you happy with the result? Our London well, office is listening. The, uh, my, my team is Arsenal, who were uh, knocked out in the uh, quarterfinals. And uh, so I, my, my immediate interest was rather lost. I did a, a, a terrible thing on uh, one of the radio stations of predicting the result, which of course, was, ah. in the end, I predicted the result right. So uh, Manchester United uh, won. But the, uh, my real sporting relief at the moment is that um, Whenever Condi turns her mind to anything, she becomes brilliant at it. And she's turned her mind to golf. And she was threatening to take me onto the, she offered to take me onto the golf course to spray. <laughs> uh, I've never played uh, golf. And I think, fortunately, we've been spared a yeah. golfing experience. Is that have right? We didn't time, unfortunately. We didn't have time to play, uh, to, to play golf. But I was, I congratulate Manchester United on the result. But I warn them that next year, Arsenal will be back for uh, revenge. <laughs> As a Gunner supporter, I'm in complete agreement. All right, first question, Larry. Um, first, I want to thank you uh, for coming to our little slice of paradise, and I hope I don't create any diplomatic incidents in pronouncing your names and titles. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I decided to focus on a comment that each of you made. Um, in, in one case, uh, the Right Honorable Milban said that Brennan's made a lot of mistakes, but we don't make them now, and Dr. Rice commented that it's too early to, to, to tell what's happening in history. And so what I was wondering about is when you're dealing with basically the creation of policy, um, to what extent do you look at not just the immediate, but what the effects will be in five, 50, or you know, several hundred years? And sort of on the other side is for what, what have you found um, as both a researcher as, and as a politician that researchers don't understand or miss when they're looking at primary sources. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Uh, let me take the last question first about researchers. And the biggest problem is that I've become convinced that very often the paper trail, which I was very dependent on as a researcher myself, only tells a little part of the story. Because what you don't have are the conversations that went on around it. You don't actually know whether that paper actually reached its destination, whether it had an effect on the principal for whom it was uh, aimed or not. That's why oral histories are important. Hmm. And um, so as a researcher or as, as secretary, one thing that I resolved to try to do is to um, not to, to try to bring about my version, but rather to try to record later on, but before it's too late, some of the considerations that may not show up in the paperwork. It's just the nature of the way we do our business. Um, as to do you try to look out? Yes. Uh, you do try to look out, but I think when you look out, you're best off to look out not at whether some particular decision is going to have the following effects in five or seven or 10 or 30 years, because there's so many variables that you could never know. But uh, we do know that a few things work. Uh, we know that uh, when strong governments that are also democratic and capable come into being, even if that takes some time, they tend to be better global citizens. They tend to be better for their, um, their populations. And uh, they tend to be more responsible in international politics. And so when I'm thinking about this, I think, how can I build well-governed democratic states for the future. Uh, that's the way that I think you think about the future uh, in decisions that, uh, that you're making. Um, uh, in a way, your, question, your first part of your question is really good. It's about tactics and strategy. Yeah. And uh, I think that the successful politicians are those who manage to get strategy right and then shape their tactics to the strategy rather than get the tactics right and then try to reinvent uh, the strategy. And there's this terrible saying that's inherited for British foreign secretaries, which is that Britain uh, has no uh, permanent alliances, it only has permanent interests. And actually, that's just so wrong. It's a good example of a strategy that was completely wrong. We do have permanent 
alliances. And those are alliances that we need to keep and that we need to develop. And I think that it's a good example of how you've got to remember who your friends are and make sure you stick by them. And I think that if you can get your strategy right, then the tactics fall into place. And that often, I mean, the interesting thing is, more often than people realize, that turns out to be good politics. Right. Because basically, the electorate know if you're doing something for the short term to pull the wool over their eyes. Okay. We've got too developed a political discourse, I think, for people to get away with that anymore. Right. Great. Ne next question over here. I'd like to ask each of you different flavors of the same question. Um, Dr. Rice, if an American who were held captive by a foreign power were subjected to simulated, water, uh, simulated drowning by waterboarding, would that shock your conscience, and would you consider that torture? Um, and uh, Secretary Millibrand, I'm wondering, to what extent has the United States' willingness to use waterboarding uh, created strain between the US and, and your government? Let me start by simply saying that uh, the United States has always and is always going to operate within our laws domestically and within our treaty obligations internationally. Uh, the fact is that after September 11th, um, whatever was legal uh, in the face of not just the attacks of September 11th, but also the anthrax attacks that followed, we were in an environment in which saving America from the next attack was of paramount concern. But even in that environment, President Bush made it very clear that we wouldn't live up to our legal responsibilities at home and to our treaty obligations abroad. Now, there has been a long evolution now of American policy about detainees and about interrogation techniques. We now have in place a set of laws uh, that were not there in 2002 and 2003. It is what democracies do. Uh, it is a situation in which the Congress asserted itself uh, concerning our practices uh, in something called uh, the Detainee Treatment Act. And so the ground is different uh, now. Uh, we've also had an opportunity to talk with our allies and our friends over this period of time about the challenges that we all face in a different kind of war and a different kind of environment. Because unlike the circumstances in law enforcement, uh, when you are faced with the prospect that someone commits a crime and then you try and find out what happened and then you punish them for what they've done, the long pole in the intent in, sto intent in stopping the next terrorist attack is finding out before they do it. We now know a great deal more about how Al-Qaeda operates thanks to uh, what we were able to learn from those early uh, detainees. We now have networks that give us information much better than we did in 2002 and 2003. And these issues have evolved. They've evolved uh, in the context of our democracy. They've evolved in the context of a constant debate about our values and what our values call us to do. And I think that we are um, in a different place now than we were. But I don't want anyone to believe that even when we were in that most difficult place, that we fail to ask the question, are we living up to our legal, um, to our laws, and to our treaty obligations? We ask the question even then. But it is a different environment now than it was then, thank God. So just to be clear, if you're I, saying I that we've I already, clear. If, if you're saying that we've always followed the law, and it's been acknowledged before Congress that we have waterboarded people. Um, will you go on record to say I, that I waterboarding think, is not torture? I think I've answered your question. Let's have the next question. Thanks. And there are, let's keep going. Or, or David, did David, you want to address this? No, I, was yeah, was say, I was just going to say that the whole world rallied to America after the 11th of September uh, 2001. I think the whole world recognizes that it pose a unique set of challenges to this country. The fact that there are differences in national law and national practice is public. 
But it, the important point I want to make is in respect to the last part of the question. Differences in national law and practice and debate do not cause us to question the fundamental nature of our alliance. And I think that's an important message that goes uh, out to you. I think there's another important message that I've been trying to give over the course of uh, three or four days in the, in the States, in New York and in Washington and in California, and I want to give it here as well. The world needs American leadership to solve the big problems that the world faces that we've been talking about. It needs the energy, the idealism, the entrepreneurialism that you see in this room. It needs American engagement. And so as you debate how you go forward, I hope that you will retain a commitment to be engaged internationally and to show the sort of leadership that is very, very important because none of the big problems are going to get solved without it. And I've, a friend of mine is um, over here at the, at the moment in, in the States and he spent the last three weeks here. And he said something really important to me. He said he's discovered that America is the least cynical country on earth. And I think it's quite an important point to put over that people see that in you. And I hope that you'll continue to be the least cynical nation on Earth because it's very, very important for the rest of us. Great. Next question over here. So my question was, uh, what is Britain doing to stop Guantanamo? Are they pressuring the US? Are they uh, backing off? Uh, what, is, what are the actions? What are the principles mm -hmm. for that? We've brought home our, um, all of our uh, British citizens that were in Guantanamo and three of the five residents uh, British residents that were in Guantanamo, we've also brought home, we've requested the return of all of the people with British connection. That's what we're doing in a practical way to uh, contribute to the joint pursuit of the closure of Guantanamo Bay. And we would gladly, by the way, return citizens to their homes um, from Guantanamo because, uh, as President Bush has said, he would like to see it closed. All of ours the, are back. Just yeah, the, the prob with Britain, we did not have a difficulty. But I'll tell you something, um, we have had problems. Uh, with the return of people from Guantanamo and meeting them again on the battlefield, including one who was recently returned who ended up uh, causing the loss of uh, a lot of innocent life in northern Iraq. And so uh, it's extremely important that when people are returned from Guantanamo that countries undertake to make sure that they are not going to return uh, to the battlefield um, Guantanamo has been visited by all kinds of people. And there, too, a lot of changes have been made in Guantanamo to make it a place that uh, respects the people who are there, respects their religious practices, uh, even provides educational opportunities for some of them. Uh, but the hard fact is there are people in the world who would harm us if given the chance. And the President of the United States also has an obligation to make sure that he's doing everything that, that, to make certain that that doesn't happen, too. Okay, we've got time for just two questions if they're very, very quick. So, uh, right here. Secretary Rice, um, there has been a lot of talk about technology um, and what we can do to, with the, um, to use technology to solve the energy problem, but there's been a recent sort of debate that's come up around um, lifestyle our energy lifestyle and how we have to evolve in our energy consumption lifestyle. So two questions really quick. What, what do you think about the current bill that just passed in Congress, uh, the energy initiatives? Uh, and second thing, briefly, do you think that our energy lifestyles have to change in order to prevent the externalities when it comes to international terrorism or the way we deal with states that are energy producers? Mm, yeah. Well, on the first, um, I, I'm not certain which uh, bill you're talking about. I, look, we do have to conserve better and we have to use uh, less energy as well as provide our energy supply from uh, sources that are not carbon-based. We have to do um, all of those things. Um, I do think that you'll see uh, that very high prices tend to make uh, a market response where people conserve more and use less. But it's not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is both to conserve and to provide more in the way of energy resources. And yes, I do think that, uh, I, I said once that oil, um, I'm watching oil um, cause all kinds of deformations in international politics. Um, it is true that there are a number of countries with um, rich oil economies that are um, using those uh, proceeds and using those um, excess profits, if you will, 
to um, feed terrorism, to fuel trouble, and uh, to refuse to make certain uh, democratic reforms in some cases that ought to be made. So yes, I think um, the price of oil is, is a problem for diplomacy. It's another reason to, uh, to get off our addiction for oil. Final question right here. Uh, Secretary Rice, you mentioned a few uh, secretaries of uh, state earlier, and uh, I would like to mention another, uh, Madeleine Albright. Uh, she was here a few years ago in that chair, and she mentioned that she and you go way back because her father was your professor and yes. so on. Uh, but once you came out to her as a Republican, she said you only talk about shoes these days. <laughs> so my uh, question is, uh, what kind of shoes do you talk about? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, the real question is, uh, what is your view on um, like having friends with different political views? Do you keep friendships strictly separate from politics? Or sometimes you go across party lines to say, oh, I think you're doing these things wrong. Your, your yeah. administration should be doing it this way, yeah. and so yeah. on. Well, well, first of all, I, I don't have a political litmus test for my friends. Um, I don't ask them, you know, which party do you belong to? Um, as a matter of fact, in the Bay Area, I have uh, Fewer, a lot fewer friends if, uh, if I had a litmus <laughs> test on party affiliation. Um, so um, obviously what matters is, is your friendship. But I can talk about politics with most of my friends. Um, and we recognize that it's talking about politics. One of my very best friends is somebody that I jokingly say is kind of to the left of Lenin in her politics. And we seem to get along uh, just fine. Um, I also tend in my work to seek out people who have very different political perspectives. Um, I see Madeline for dinner um, every once in a while, and we don't just talk about shoes. We actually talk about politics. I ask her about uh, what she thinks. Uh, she tells me she's not shy. Um, and uh, I find that very valuable because, um, you know, when I was a professor at Stanford, um, which I'll again, um, I used to tell people that if you are only in the company of people who agree with you, um, then find other company. Because it is really stultifying to only be with people who constantly say amen to everything that you say. Um, honest debate and honest disagreement is extremely important, not just to democracy, but extremely important, important to the development of good policy and uh, of ways to, to go forward. And uh, so I tend to seek out people who don't agree um, in my work. It's kind of in the nature of an academic to do that. But it's been very helpful um, while being in Washington, too. And you have to remember two things. The first is, that uh, just because somebody disagrees with you uh, doesn't mean that uh, they just don't understand your argument. They might genuinely disagree. <laughs> and secondly, they're not unpatriotic because they disagree. Any Tory mates? Yeah, uh, well, it's, 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 uh, just off a, uh, a reflection on this. Um, the, the, the toughest lesson that I've learned in politics is that if you want to win an argument, you've got to address the best argument of your opponent not the worst argument. It's very tempting in politics to make a debating point, and especially in our political system where we have the debating tradition where you're standing you know, three feet uh, opposite your uh, conservative, in, in conservative opposite number. There are you know, 150 MPs on each side uh, shouting at each other. The temptation is to actually make a debating point, but actually you win the argument by taking on the toughest and best part of your opponent's argument, not the worst. Secondly, and finally, just a point about bipartisanship. I think that there are two versions of this. One, of, one version of bipartisanship is that the political class are a bunch of maids who have more in common with each other than they do with the people who elect them. That's dangerous. That's dangerous because then the political class is an elite that's out of touch and actually uh, not able to serve uh, people. Um, there's an alternative version, which is where, the, if you like, some of the civilities of politics are remembered, and where you do, in the way that Condi Rice has described, try to engage with people who you respect on the other side. And it would be ridiculous to say that there are no people on the other side of politics who you don't respect. You respect them because they're 
people of integrity, they've got serious arguments, but you disagree with them. And I think those sort of relationships are quite important, not least because, remember, you're always trying to hone your own arguments so that you can nail them next time. So uh, it's, important <laughs> to, uh, it's important to keep up those relationships, uh, hopefully in the way that, that, that Condi has described. I have to say that, um, David, I actually take to watching Question Time sometime <laughs> and your debates in the comments because uh, even when I don't agree with someone who's making an argument, you make it in the most brilliant way. It's, it's, uh, it's got to be that uh, command of the English language and that accent, which I've decided gives the Brits an unfair advantage in everything that they do. Well, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll have to close. Uh, Secretary Rice, Foreign Secretary Miliband, thanks so much for spending so much time with us. Please come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.